Hey guys, Rainer and Chase here, exercise my first member rights vlog style. Happy New Year to you all. I'm assuming if you're watching this video, you've already seen my worst songs video for this year, but I'll have the link in the polo card as well as in the description for if you haven't. I say this because one thing I talked about in that video was how I felt that 2023 was the worst year for pop music I've experienced since 2014 at the earliest and 2016 at the latest, with how little of good or even decent pop songs I heard throughout the year. But if there's anything you guys know about me, it's that even if the videos don't perform as well as the worst songs videos given the very obvious negativity bias that exists on YouTube, I still feel very strongly about this video being made. I feel very strongly about the good hit songs of this year being acknowledged and celebrated, even in a year as mediocre as this. You can't have a worst list without a best list. Unless you're Dosa Buckley, I guess. Even if I don't feel about pop music in 2023 the way I do about years like 2015 or 2016 or 2019 or even 2022, I'm glad that I was able to round up 10 songs to talk about for this video, even before the year-end chart ended up coming out earlier than I was anticipating. There were some names I was happy to see on the year-end chart and some songs I was looking forward to potentially get to talk about. A prevailing worry I have every year is that because of how much of an outsider I consider myself to the world of chart analysis, I hear so little of pop songs that I end up canceling one or both of my yearly pop music evaluation and replace them with something different. But along with What's Wrong With, the Best and Worst Song series is my most consistently popular series that my audience tunes in for, and not making those videos just doesn't feel right. It's a tradition on my channel that I've held dear for a decade, and it can't be understated that I'm grateful and relieved that I was still able to buckle down and put these videos together, even when more got added to my weekly routine while dealing with the worry in the back of my mind that I wouldn't have enough to say about the songs on either list. So as per usual, the rules for this series are that if a song is included on the main list, it's because I've heard it, thought it was cool, and it made it on the Billboard year-end chart for this year. If you're skeptical that a song is actually there, check the link in the description to look at the year-end chart, see the particular song with the position I'm claiming, and see that I'm not making it up. So after everything I previously said about this year, let's have a look at what I believe to be the best hit songs of 2023. Number 10. It feels like years since I've talked about Post Malone. I've noticed in recent years his newer music hasn't been as well received compared to albums like Hollywood's Bleeding or even Beerbongs and Bentley's. I didn't mind 12 Carat Toothache, but I could tell it was his weakest album, which is why songs like I Like You with Doja Cat and One Right Now with The Weeknd were songs I went out of my way to not talk about last year. Because I like Post a lot, and I don't want to be too critical of his stuff or call it mid just because it doesn't measure up to the really great songs of his I talked about in the past. But it was quite clear with his latest album from this year, Austin, that he's leaning harder into more of a pop rock sound than the trappy pop sound he was known for in the late 2010s. The way I see it, Post has always been a rocker at heart, so this is his way of trying to lean more into doing rock stuff while being poppy enough to not completely alienate his original audience. And through that, we get Chemical. I wouldn't really say this is the most unique concept for a song, it's a song comparing love to an addiction, and the word choices are decently clever. But the thing that interests me about Chemical's lyrics are how Post does a lot to emphasize the dependency aspect. The thing about addictions is that even if you know that it's unhealthy, something compels you to go back to it. Every time I'm ready to make a change, you turn around and fuck out all my brains. One reason much of the rock scene is cool with Post is not only because they know he's a rocker at heart, but because he embodies that lifestyle. He parties hard and does a lot of drugs to the point where you question his sanity, and this is a song I see reflected in that. By no means is this the hardest rocking song I've heard from Post, but just like I said about Stay by the Kid Leroy last year, Chemical is a song I see as wanting to be a pop punk song. It's got the drive, it's got the chord progression, and even when Post does that shaky vibrato thing when he holds a note out, it's got the melodies. Listen to this drum fill that takes place after the second chorus. I feel like if the guitars were louder and the drums were punchier, this would sound like the kind of tune a pop punk band would throw together. And I think Post knows this. You can feel him veering in that direction as he leans more into the rocker he is. I have a feeling if he leans more into that, maybe the pop fans in his audience might not be ready for it, but I can see it being quite the spectacle. And that's one thing I really appreciate about Chemical. I did say last year that I hoped there'd be more pop songs that implement pop punk elements, and much like how Post Malone's featuring Ozzy Osbourne on Take What You Want helped guide people to the rock rabbit hole, a song like this is a good sign for that. Give me, give me some good thing, Number nine. This song does not make me want to snooze. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Come on, that pun was begging to be made and you know it. So you remember the person that was featured on Kiss Me More by Doja Cat that I joked in Best Songs of 2021 about not being of any relation to RZA or Jizza from Wu-Tang Clan, SZA? This is her. Morgan Wallen may have been the big dominating force in pop music throughout the year, but it was SZA who had the big breakout year. 
Some of the songs I was most interested in talking about this year were songs of hers. Yes, the one you're expecting to see will come later in this video, as I don't have a rule about one song per artist. But after that, Snooze was a real treat here. And this is the kind of R&B that hits just right for me. It's just so relaxing that I almost feel tempted to fall into a state of pure bliss that I end up not realizing my eyes are closing and I, well, snooze. I like being energized by music as much as the next guy, but there's something about a song that can just calm your nerves and make you feel like very little else matters in that moment. I feel about Snooze very similar to how I've described Flying in a Blue Dream by Joe Satriani. It might not have the soaring melodies and the goosebumpy chord progression that song has, but it relaxes me in a similar way that song does. You almost don't realize the violent references SZA veers into in the song. We'll talk more about that when we get to that certain other song, but even when she says things like you just feel way too damn good to even care or go, wait, what was that? When I talked about her part in Kiss Me More back in 2021, I mentioned that the overall vibe of the song overpowers how out there the more sexual references she makes are, and it's the same thing here. I guess this song could also be seen as one of those songs where you feel this rush from all the dark shit being described that it just fuels your sexual desire. This song is about missing your partner that you've been apart from for a while. So I suppose a lot of the imagery being conveyed in the lyrics is meant to correlate to this longing SZA has to be with him. One thing I can't help but think about is right after this line. Someone really likes Aerosmith and or the movie Armageddon. I know the concept of missing your partner to the extent that you don't want to fall asleep isn't unique by any means, but it's kind of cute how both Snooze and I Don't Want to Miss a Thing basically say the same thing, just the SZA song is a lot darker, whereas Aerosmith's is more lovey-dovey, what with it being written by Diane Warren and all, who's written plenty more songs like that. No matter the case, I'm glad SZA's been having such a big year, but we'll be getting even more violent later on in this video. For now, let's get a little lighter. Give me, give me some good thing, Number 8. When putting this video together, I did a lot more second guessing than I care to admit. With how confusing of a year 2023 was for pop music, it kind of speaks to that fact that there was also a lot of confusion on my end about how I was going to do things here. I originally had this song standing in for a song I decided to scrap from the list. I knew I really liked what I heard when I first took notice of the song, but I wasn't expecting to put it at all higher than I was intending. It's a neat little tune that we have Tickety Talk to thank for its virality, Golden Hour, not Chower, thank god, by this dude called Jivka. <coughs> Massachusetts-based pop rock band Paris? What are you guys doing here? And why do you sound like my friend Disco Duck Gandalf? If you could pronounce our name right, surely you could pronounce his right too. His name is very obviously Jake, as in Jacob Dodge Lawson. Well, yeah, I know that, and I obviously mean that as no disrespect, but to put it simply, I'm just going to keep pronouncing it as Jivka because it's just fun to say. Jivka. Jivka. Wow, I sound like a Pokemon now. Ha, <sighs> sort yourself. This song sounds really pretty. I love how the piano not only adds a peculiar texture, but the chords really stand out. I like when I feel compelled to Google a chord sheet so I can better comprehend what the chords are doing because this is one of those songs that absolutely calls for it. Those major 7 and minor 7 chords may sound weird or hipstery compared to what the average pop listener is used to hearing, let alone this chord change after the chorus. But there's this brightness to them that Jibka's singing and his vocal melodies help with elevating the song to high heights. It's only fitting that a song this bright yet mysterious sounding is about a woman whose beauty lights up a scenario. Even as the song gives me some bedroom musician vibes, the dude flexes his musical chops all throughout the song. The verses have him rapping in this shy 21 Pilots kind of style that sounds endearing up against the patterns of the piano. It was just two lovers, sitting in the car, listening to blonde, falling for each other. Even though I wish the song had some more instrumentation in places like the chorus, it still feels like a massive spectacle and showcasing of how far a person's musical capabilities can go in this kind of a context. Golden Hour is a delight, and I hope Jibka can stick around and find more ways to challenge pop audiences. Give me, give me some good thing, Number 7. You know, it's kind of funny that the year I debut a series on my channel about cover songs is also the year I talk about a cover song in one of my year-end videos. Although there have been plenty of cover songs to have made it on the year-end chart, even in recent years, which surprised me, I've never actually talked about one in this series. I've certainly talked about songs with annoying samples of older songs, but never a cover song. It's so rare these days for a hit radio artist to release a cover song and it becomes a huge hit, and I wish I could come up with a reason why, other than maybe they just don't really feel like performing any. So hearing about Luke Combs covering Fast Car by Tracy Chapman definitely got my ears to perk up. 
Fast Car was always a song I recognized as having a great deal of significance and importance to it, but I never really gave too much thought to. And Luke Combs was always a country artist I saw as being very talented and having wrote some good songs, but I never really took much time to listen to much of. So I knew talking about the song was going to be a good exercise for me as a music commentator, as well as serving as a little kick in the shin for me to give Combs' music the time I gave to Chris Stapleton's music that helped him to become my favorite country artist. So to start, this is Tracy Chapman. She's a folk musician who rose to prominence and high levels of critical acclaim in the late 80s. Fast Car is seen these days as a staple for acoustic guitar players, and it always shocked me that the song came out in 1988. The late 80s are a time I associate with the glam metal explosion at the time, influenced by the success of bands like Bon Jovi, Def Leppard, Guns N' Roses, and Poison, along with the peak commercial popularity of thrash metal in the wake of Metallica's rise to prominence. Similar to what I said about the origins of alternative metal in my Korn video, I look at a song like Fast Car as an early sign that a change was on the horizon musically by the turn of the decade. It's a very sincere sounding song about making your way through life and escaping from a situation of poverty and misery. It sounds sad, but there's also a hopeful edge to it, which is kind of accentuated by the song being in A major, that Tracy and her partner can ascend to a better life and get a taste of the American dream. When comparing it with Luke Combs' version, it's definitely more raw, but I don't like viewing that as detracting from Combs' version's quality as a song. It feels really heartwarming how the guitar motif of the original translates to country, but if you think about it, that kind of speaks to how closely related folk and country have always been throughout their history. Me being someone who likes tuning his guitars a half step down from E standard, I'd be lying if I were to say I didn't prefer Combs playing it in the key of A flat rather than A. There have been times when I'd get the guitar motif stuck in my head and I'd have to stop and think about the notes I was hearing so I knew which version was in my head. Usually it's the original. And although I like the way Chapman sings the chorus in the original, I feel like the instrumentation in Combs' version brings it to its full potential, though that could just be me not being the hugest folk fan. His version is also a little slower than the original, and there is the odd melody that's sung differently, but I could very well be letting the overly detail-oriented part of me take control when making those observations. But outside of that and the warm tone his voice brings, he goes out of his way to not change much of anything, if even at all. If you haven't seen the first episode of the front cover, which I highly recommend you check out because I'm quite proud of how it came out, there are a few songs I talk about in that video where the original, made by an African-American group or artist, is covered by a band consisting of people of a different race. While some people may be quick to write those kinds of cover songs off as nothing more than cultural appropriation, a thing I mention a lot in that video is that enough was being done on the parts of those bands to not come across as disrespectful to the original artist when covering their respective songs. And more to the point, pretty much anyone can relate to the experiences being depicted in the original songs, including Fast Car. And even though Luke Combs doesn't really change anything about the original's lyrics, the reason why is because he respects Tracy Chapman and the original song so much that he doesn't want to do anything that could potentially be considered damaging to it. Of course, this does mean that this line wasn't changed. While I'm sure there are a number of, shall we say, terminally online people out there using that line as grounds to make jokes about, oh, Luke Combs is trans, confirmed. I see that less as Combs being lazy and uncreative, and more like he wants to treat the original with the utmost care. This is a song that's personal to Chapman, and a song that's resonated with many people hoping for the better life, so he wants the original's narrative to stay as is. Maybe he's being too careful not to touch too much, but with all that the song conveys either way, I'm totally fine with this version existing. And guess what? Tracy Chapman is too. It's doubtful that this is the kind of song I'd want to talk about in a front cover video in the future, but for what it's trying to be, I find it to be respectable. Even if you really want to be that guy and argue that it's a problem that the success of this cover by a straight white man is what helped Tracy Chapman to have a number one hit and something something first Google suggestion, the one thing I think we can all agree on is that this will obviously never replace or displace the original Fast Car. But you know something? I don't believe for a second that Combs ever had the intention of doing that. While there may be covers that we prefer over the original, a number of which I talked about in that hour-long cover song fuckfest, I don't think anyone covers a song with that in mind. They cover a song because they like it and want to put their own spin on it. And unless the cover actually legit sucks, people are totally fine with it existing and being its own thing because of that principle. That's what I think ultimately matters at the end of the day when it comes to cover songs. I can't really say I have a preference for Luke Combs' cover of Fast Car or the original version, as I like them pretty much equally, but even when not comparing the two, I see Combs' version as a nice time and an enjoyable country song, and since I'm not someone that likes a ton of country, that's some pretty high praise. Gimme, gimme some good thing, Number 6. Ah, uh, once again, TikTok proves to be useful. Until I Found You by Steven Sanchez, why do I keep thinking of Steven Sondheim when I think of this? Is it just because they're both Stevens? Is one of those songs where there's beauty in its simplicity. It's not trying to be something overly complex, lyrically or even musically, or beat you over the head with some profound message. Do I appreciate when pop songs do that? Yes! But there are times when you need a break from that, and that's a big thing I like about having this song around. 
If you've seen the War Songs video this year, you heard me say that Megan Trainer is the one artist, if not one of a small few artists, that I have no qualms at all saying that I hate. And not like this is a major reason why I like this song, but Steve here is succeeding at everything Megan Trainer fails at doing with her sound. Until I Found You is very clearly a 50s, 60s throwback love song like you'd hear at the dance in Back to the Future, and it sounds so unbelievably carefree and wholesome compared to how nauseating it sounds in Megan Trainer's songs. While I could question if we really need more throwback songs like this rather than explore something new and different sounding and rant about how out of control the nostalgia market has gotten, at the end of the day I hardly get a smile on my face like the one I get listening to this song. Even outside of the throwback aspect, I think it's really cool hearing guitar used in this song. While there is a part of me that's not crazy about the guitar being played with the pickup selector being all the way to the right since it sounds a bit too trebly when played on a clean setting, and I wish Ian Fitchuk would switch to at least the middle selection, which is my favorite for playing clean, that twanginess combined with that reverb helps the song to sound all the more vintage. And although the chord progression on paper might not seem like anything to write home about, there are some pretty cool things going on like the voicings in the chords. In my Power Ballads video that I find to be pretty outdated nowadays, the song I put at number one was When I Look Into Your Eyes by Firehouse. It's not just my favorite ballad and favorite love song of all time, but the key changes it implements going from G flat major to A flat major to B flat major are my favorite that I've heard in any song and played a major role in helping me learn to love ballads. One thing I noted about the song in that video is its subversion of the typical 1-5-4 progression by playing a minor 3 chord instead of a 5 chord that helps it to sound more harmonically interesting. And Until I Found You does that same thing with its use of the D minor chord in the spot where a less experienced songwriter would use its relative major, F. <laughs> But it doesn't stop there. I love in the middle of the chorus where the way the progression turns around to the E flat chord after the B flat chord is by sandwiching a B flat 7 chord in between. I fall into, I was lost. Again, very characteristic of old timey doo wop rock and roll, and it sounds so bright. And the way the chorus ends by having an E flat minor chord resolve back to B flat major adds a similar spiciness to the song. It reminds me a lot of a chord change I noted in Circle of Life from The Lion King in my Disney songs video. Just sticking with a plain old E flat chord to resolve down with would be way too typical, and I really like how the song goes the extra mile with its chord progression in much the same way the Firehouse song does. Hell, while I have that Firehouse song on my mind, I can't help but think of my favorite line from the song at this part of the chorus. Yeah, it might not be the most original thing to say in a love song, but when you're in that moment, it's a really profound thing to think about, how everything was building up to finding this person, and how clear everything now feels. If you've been in a relationship before, even if it didn't end up lasting, it's a feeling that cannot go understated. It's also why it sounds especially wholesome, knowing that the backing harmony vocals on this song are performed by Stephen's then-girlfriend, Georgia Brown. It kind of sucks knowing they aren't together, because the way their voices harmonize makes me think of those old couples that still act as kooky about each other as they were when they were younger. That line in the chorus also makes me think of this. That's love for you. There's also a little instrumental break after the chorus that Genius calls a guitar solo. All I have to say about that is, you are baiting me, sir. At the end of the day, Until I Found You makes me think lots of happy thoughts. Even if it might not have the most original sound ever, and even if the lyrics might not be super extraordinary, I think that warm fuzziness the song exudes speaks way more than they ever could. And that's why I'm glad I got to hear this song. Give me, give me some good thing, Number 5. 
See, told you it'd be here. I've never really considered myself a movie buff rather than someone that just enjoys movies. One thing I've been spending a lot of time doing this year is taking a dive into my extensive movie collection and revisiting movies that I haven't seen in a while, as well as watching a bunch that I've neglected on seeing for the first time. I know what I'm about to say is going to shock the movie buffs in my audience, particularly Quentin Tarantino fans, but one such movie, or rather pair of movies, that I hadn't seen until this year was Kill Bill. Much like I mentioned in the previous video about watching the Barbie movie as part of my research to see if there was any context behind any of the songs from the soundtrack that made it on the year-end chart that I wanted to talk about, I also watched both volumes of Kill Bill, partly for research purposes, to see how the events and themes correlated with SZA's massive song that gets its name from them. I swear, this is the most I've watched movies for researching a project since the Disney songs video. And this is going to have some spoilers, since it's relevant to the song. Volume 1 of the movie centers around a former assassin by the name of Beatrix Kiddo, played by Uma Thurman, who goes on a massive revenge quest against a group of assassins led by her ex-lover, the aforementioned bam, 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 bam. after they disrupt her wedding day and send her into a coma while she was pregnant. Volume 2 explores the motivations and backstories of both Beatrix and Bill, and it eventually culminates in Bill admitting to Beatrix that the reason he did the things he did was out of bitterness and jealousy, that she would fake her death to get away from him and marry someone else while being pregnant with what he thinks is that man's child. I wouldn't have to give these details about the duology if they weren't referenced in the song, as SZA is basically singing from the perspective of both Bill and Beatrix. The verses depict her being upset at the turn of events, like Bill was, and the chorus quite literally has her saying, Which, yeah, is Beatrix's goal throughout the duology. If you're unfamiliar with these movies, SZA probably sounds psychotic to you as she says that, and you're not wrong. The Kill Bill duology is a wild ride, with perhaps the best staged fight scenes I've ever seen in any movie. But Kill Bill the song strips away the action and revenge plot and dresses it down to the relationship drama that drives the narrative. So even if you've never seen these movies before like I did before making this video, you get the feel of what SZA's going for with her depiction of what's essentially a crime of passion. I might kill my Never underestimate the fucked up shit some people are willing to do when they're driven by these intense feelings. With that in mind, I feel compelled to compare this song to Hellfire from Hunchback of Notre Dame, especially after hearing this line. If I, can't have you, no one should. I talk about this more at length in my Disney songs video, but Judge Claude Frollo is another character that's driven to do some heinous things fueled by the intense feelings of desire he feels for someone that's not only part of a group he actively persecutes, but need I remind you, is way too young for him. He too has the intention of killing Esmeralda if she doesn't give herself over to him, even if his priesthood forbids him from marrying and of course fornicating with a woman. There is a similar brand of darkness to Kill Bill and the character SZA is acting as, the difference being that Hellfire is supposed to creep you out, while you can't help but feel badass with Kill Bill. I was gearing up to feature the song in this video months before I sat down to watch the Kill Bill duology. Why would I do that if the parallels to these movies were initially lost on me? Simple, because the song groups. I already liked what SZA brought to the table when I heard her on Kiss Me More, but Kill Bill is what really sold me on her style. Some of my favorite kind of hip-hop and R&B is the kind that sounds jazzy with a flair that feels like vintage 90s, and that was a big thing that sucked me into this song. I didn't even care that she was singing about wanting to kill people because I was enjoying myself that much, but that didn't stop some momentary chills from coming in during the last chorus when the lyrics get changed to, I just killed my ex, killed his girlfriend next, rather be in hell than alone, now that the deed is done. Like I said before, it was really cool seeing SZA have her big breakout year, and I don't think that would have been possible without a song like this. Kill Bill may be considerably darker compared to other pop songs, but it's nonetheless one of the most fun songs of the year. Snooze is cool too, but it's not the curveball that this is, which I believe is the true reason it stuck around as much as it did. Gimme, give gimme give some good thing, Number 4 Yeah, if it wasn't already clear enough last year, I think it's safe to say I definitely don't hate Taylor Swift, at least not anymore compared to how much I might have in the past. I feel like she's been on an upward trajectory with me ever since 2019, and if you told me 10 years ago that I would be speaking at all positively about her, let alone putting a song of hers as high on my best list as I am, you get the biggest, dumbest look of confusion in response. Mind you, I still think I Knew You Were Trouble, Look What You Made Me Do, You Need To Calm Down, etc. are terrible, terrible songs. But I gotta say, it feels nice not having whatever chip on my shoulder I might have had about her when I first started out. It really adds another aspect to the coming-of-age story I've been depicting on my channel in recent years. I don't think Taylor Swift will ever make a better song than the Taylor version of All Too Well that I talked about last year, or at the very least I don't think I will ever admire a song of hers like I do that one. But if there was ever a song that would humanize her to me, it would be Antihero. 
She's made a bunch of songs about relationships and breakups, one of which being the aforementioned All Too Well. A common talking point when mentioning that is the idea that perhaps the reason her relationships keep failing is less because of them and more because of her. You are all the things that are wrong with you. It's not the alcohol or the drugs or any of the shitty things that happened to you in your career or when you were a kid. It's you. I was actually going through some old pictures I had saved on my computer and found this meme that puts her in the scene from Spongebob where he realizes he's the maniac, maniac. I have a feeling the creator of this meme went ballistic when they first heard this song because, well. It's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. Hi, the problem, I'm Shades. Ah! This is the song where Taylor finally introspects about why things go the way they do in her life. After all these years of putting out songs like Shake It Off and You Need to Calm Down that are meant to clap back at them haters, or songs like Look What You Made Me Do where she puts on some dark edgy villain persona to try to make us feel intimidated as she claps back, or songs like Blank Space where it feels like there's supposed to be some introspection but it gets muddied by some aura of sarcasm, it seems she's finally taken a step back to consider, Hey, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe they don't deserve that and my frustrations should be directed at something else. Although it's hard to know for sure that that's what's going on in her head, what I can tell you is that this is relatable as fuck, and it's for that reason that I've been kind of scared to write this segment, let alone record it right now. I think we've all felt at some point in our lives like we're at rock bottom, and I'm not referring to the creepy town from Spongebob when I say that. We felt dejected when things don't go the way we were hoping. We've developed some unhealthy habits, developed cases of self-loathing and self-doubt, paranoia even, pushed people away, unintentionally or not, and felt afraid to attack these issues head on. I'd be lying if I were to say this isn't what existence felt like for me a lot of the time, irrespective of the depression I already deal with. It's almost like this is the reason Bojack Horseman speaks so much to people, including me. In fact, it's my headcanon that Taylor's inspiration to write this song came from watching Bojack and realizing she's probably been Bojack to a lot of people in her life. When dealing with these kinds of intrusive thoughts, it can feel quite lonely, and that's a hard thing to admit. The moment I heard these lamentations from Taylor, I felt chills, not just because it isn't what I'm used to hearing from her, but because I knew it was speaking to me similar to how I felt after watching BoJack for the first time. We're all the good guy in our own story, and that's the primary reason why it can hurt hearing someone contradict that idea. Nobody likes considering the idea that maybe they're not the good guy at all. This sometimes leads to a person lashing out at or condescending to anyone that would make such an assertion, which is the easiest way to get people to believe that you can't take criticism. That's what Taylor Swift's songs have felt like for a long time, and it takes a real modicum of maturity to even acknowledge this sort of flaw in yourself. Did you hear my covert narcissism like disguise as altruism like some kind of consciousness? I like to think of myself as a decent and likable person, easy to get along with, capable of listening and understanding others even if I might not agree with them. Not flawless by any means, but at the very least not a monster deserving of the ultimate cancel treatment. But even the kinds of people that we do see as deserving of the ultimate cancel treatment have that view of themselves, so who's to say I'm the one that has the monumentally wrong idea either? And that leads to the scariest line in the song. At tea time, everybody agrees. There's this idea that if enough people are saying something is a problem, then it's probably a problem. I don't think it's fair to have a black and white view like that because sometimes they might just have the absolute wrong idea, but the possibility is at least there. And that's when it's time to look deep inside yourself and try to come to terms with that idea and figure out what you want to do or not do about it. The ball's in your court either way. It's been in my court many times, and more often than not, I decide it's not worth it to stay in a situation I don't see improving and just move on to something better. But even then, there will still be times when the intrusive thoughts veer back in that maybe I'm letting my anxiety and insecurity take control. This is rough shit to be thinking about, which is why I like to put my focus into lighthearted things that I find to be stimulating, healthy, and that I feel happy indulging in. And it's also why I really gotta commend Taylor for even writing something like this, because I can't imagine a lot of people are super comfortable allowing themselves to show this level of vulnerability, let alone in front of a hefty amount of people. I want to clarify that this segment isn't me fishing for sympathy, and I don't think that's what Taylor is doing in the song either. I see it as both of us realizing that the first step towards recovery is acknowledging that the problem exists. It's not an easy process, and it's going to take a lot of work, but by doing this, we're already on the right path. And that's why even if I might not love this song as much as All Too Well, I deeply appreciate that Antihero exists. I know I've said a lot of negative things about Taylor Swift over the years, and although I can't say I no longer stand by the things I've said about those songs, I think it's only right that I extend my hand for a YouTube handshake. Let me just make one more joke. Sometimes I feel like everybody is a sexy baby. No! What do you think you're doing pulling an Ian Watkins like this? Repeat after me. Babies are not sexy. Oh!
I love babies. <laughs> Number three. So when I mentioned watching the Barbie movie to see the context behind certain songs inclusion, one of them was this song. If I can be honest, I mainly had What Was I Made For written on my notes of songs to potentially talk about in the year-end videos because Billie Eilish is an artist I generally like hearing from, and I didn't think it would matter how it was utilized in the Barbie movie. That's the main angle I'm going to be speaking from about this because I think if I talk too much about its role in the movie, I'd end up spoiling it for anyone who hasn't seen it because it takes place towards the end. What I will say is that compared to the other songs from the movie, it feels much calmer to the point where you're surprised to hear it here. One of the main themes of the movie is existentialism. Characters such as Ryan Gosling's Ken question their purpose in life, what they're here to do, what it means, all of these difficult questions that there's no easy answer for. That's the main aspect of Margot Robbie's character's arc as well, and it's not too hard to draw parallels to Billie Eilish herself. She's somebody who got really famous really quickly at such a young age, and became so overwhelmed by all the adulation she received that it kind of broke her on the inside. And as a celebrity, or even just a public figure, there's this expectation that you have to be really positive all the time and look beautiful and be a great role model for everyone, not too dissimilar to what Barbie the brand was originally created to be. Whenever I think of Billie Eilish, it's not hard to think about someone whose whole life was turned upside down amidst her success and who doesn't feel the joy she thinks that she should. So in a way, it's honestly kind of perfect that she sang a song like this as part of a movie that touches on these themes. Even if What Was I Made For might not be as upbeat as other songs in the movie, I really like how contemplative the piano sounds. It brings back memories of when I talked about When the Party's Over in 2019, and I felt a similar way about a slow, piano-driven song like that. I've always believed Billy is at her best in the less abrasive sounding songs of hers, where she sounds more vulnerable. That's the main thing that humanized her to many people, including me. But you know what really humanizes her to me? This line. Think I forgot how to be happy. Something I'm not, but something I can be. Something I wait for. There's this one line from South Park that those lyrics make me think a lot about. How do you go on when nothing makes you happy? Yeah, that's what depression feels like. It was a tough call if I was going to rank this above or below Antihero, since they both hit pretty close to home with me for pretty similar reasons. But I think this is what ultimately pushed What Was I Made For a little over the edge. When you feel like shit, physically or emotionally, you find yourself questioning when there was a time that you didn't feel this way. And you want to go back, and you think you can go back one day. And kind of like I talked about with Numb Little Bug last year, that's enough to keep you going. That line stopped me in my tracks and made me go, dude. That's the thing I love about this song. The song is sad. It asks a lot of hard questions about what it means to exist, to be happy, to know what you're doing and where you're going. And it knows better than to end on a sad note. It's a lot like how I felt watching the Barbie movie. I went into it thinking it was going to be some generic movie based around an established property targeted towards a demographic I'm not a part of, and I didn't expect it to be as philosophical as it was. I was curious how What Was I Made For would be implemented in this movie, and I honestly think it was done so in the best way. And along with that, I like how a song like this gives me more reasons to appreciate Billie Eilish as much as I do. Give me, give me some good thing, Number two. Continuing with the Barbie movie songs, it's kind of neat that the movie included a song by the pinkest artist not named Pink, Dua Lipa. You know, the more that I listen to her, the more resentment I feel towards 2018 Shades for underestimating her the way I did. Dance the Night continues that funky disco sound I've come to love hearing from her, even if I wouldn't say I like it as much as Levitating or Break My Heart. I was originally thinking of having this be my number one this year, because in a year like 2023 where it didn't really feel like there was a lot of fun stuff in the world of pop, leave it to someone like Dua Lipa to put out a song that reminds me of the kind of stuff I like hearing in pop songs. One of my favorite things about Dua's songs is the bass. There have been some funky bass lines in her songs, but even as it essentially alternates between B minor and E minor, it feels warm and inviting here. Her sound has been described by a lot of people as a disco throwback, and I feel like this is the song where she leans the hardest into that. Something I mentioned offhandedly in my hour-long cover song Fuckfest is that I recently came around on ABBA after developing an appreciation for the vintage overtones in their sound, and Dance the Night feels like it has a lot of that going for it. One moment I really like is the E major chord that leads the chorus in. Lyrically, this song reminds me a good bit of Don't Start Now, in the sense that Dew was basically telling us, I'm gonna have a good time and there's nothing you can do to stop me. It might not be saying as much as Don't Start Now, but it certainly does more to emphasize the good vibes of her night out, even in spots like the bridge, where she hints that something is bringing her down that she doesn't want ruining the night. Even when the tears are flowing, the diamonds on my face, I still keep the party going up. 
I've previously called Levitating my favorite Dua Lipa song, but there have been times since then where Overplay got me to question if that's still the case. So in addition to how Dance the Night reminded me of how fun pop is supposed to be, it reminded me of everything I love about Dua Lipa as an artist. It might not be as plot relevant or thematically relevant as what was I made for, but it's only fitting that it's the song that plays in the establishing dance scene towards the beginning of the Barbie movie. Not sure what else to say, this is just a solid fun song. It's the kind of song I really hoped this year would have to offer. I was pretty sure the song would be number one in this video for that simple reason, but after thinking about it, the song I ended up going with did something a little more that I really think should be acknowledged to that degree. It's been a while since I've been really upset to not see a song on the year-end chart that I was looking forward to putting on the main list because I was prepared to put it pretty high on. Hopefully it carries over to next year, but for now, my honorable mention for this year is Bad Idea Right by Olivia Rodrigo. When I talked about Good For You and Best Songs of 2021, I mentioned that the song was a great showcasing of Olivia's true potential as an artist, and that I really wanted to see her lean more into that rock sound in the future. And I'm happy to say that, while there are still a number of softer tracks on her sophomore album, Guts, that I can't really say I care for much, I feel like much of the album was spent doing exactly what I hoped she would do stylistically. Along with tracks like Get In Back, Love Is Embarrassing, and my favorite on the album, Ballad of a Homeschooled Girl, Bad Idea Right is a great example of how she went that extra mile to where I feel compelled to say, Guts top sour for me. Is it the hardest rocking song I've heard from Olivia? No. But it's definitely there. I've mentioned a few times before that I don't like Driver's License, but a common point people make to defend it is that it's a song about heartbreak from a teenager's perspective, and that's reason enough to lower your standards. Bad Idea Right is a song that conveys those teen angst dilemmas much better since it doesn't sound whiny. It has a lot of that sarcasm that was present on Good For You and combines it with the frustrating tone the song calls for. It's a song about flirting with the idea of getting together with your ex, even though the little voice in your head is saying, I don't think that's such a good idea, and lying to yourself and everyone around you that nothing will happen because this means nothing. That's what makes this line really funny. <laughs> I'd say this song makes me think more of those indie garage rock revival bands from the 2000s than it does pop punk, but I think it's just as effective for what she's going for lyrically. There's a lot of attitude in the music, especially towards the end where there's an over-distorted, playing random notes and not giving a shit guitar solo. Between this and Vampire, while I think the singing on Vampire is great even if the lyrics really aren't, I'd sooner flock to Bad Idea right for this video. If it makes it on the year-end chart next year and I get to talk about it, sweet. Otherwise, I'm glad I got to hear a song that sounds like this from Olivia become a hit this year. I'll also take a moment to talk about the final Beatles song ever made, Now and Then, since I have the stupidest feeling of optimism that we could see it on the year-end chart next year, given that it charted in the top 10 when it came out last November. So, the Beatles, they need no introduction. You know him, you love him, anybody who says otherwise is either trolling or just trying to be an edgy contrarian douche. They've made a laundry list of songs throughout their career and didn't have a number of them officially released at the time. Some went on to become finished and subsequently released, with this song that started out as just a little tape-recorded demo John Lennon made sometime in the 70s being the only one to not get finished for a long time. It was rediscovered during the production of the Get Back documentary, and AI was used to isolate John's vocals so Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr, the two Beatles still alive today, could take it to the studio and finish the job as a final commemorative send-off for the much-beloved band. It's not the best song I've ever heard from the Beatles. Hearing this kind of production being done does feel weird to hear on a Beatles song, and it's nothing really out of the ordinary lyrically for them either. If I had to pick an album I think now and then would fit the best on tonally, my gut is telling me Sgt. Pepper, since a lot of the Beatles' more experimental tracks are on that album, and this certainly feels at home with its experimental nature. It nonetheless feels nice that the song was made, that Paul and Ringo cared so much about their old friend and the legacy of their band to help the song see the light of day. It is a little unnerving that the song could have only gotten finished with some help from AI, but I've always been of the belief that AI can be used liberally, and its usage here is one instance of it. Nothing really more to say except, rest in peace to John Lennon and George Harrison. To Paul and Ringo, thank you for making this, and best of luck to you both. Gimme, give gimme give some good thing, Number one. When I saw that Jelly Roll, not to be confused with Jelly Roll Morton or the cool song by Blue Murder, was making his way on the charts this year, I got really intrigued. I saw him open for Shinedown last year at the good old Xfinity Center in Mansfield, and he was getting a great crowd response. I had never heard of this big guy prior, but he was combining rock, rap, and country, kind of like a less corny and more likable kid rock, musically speaking. This wasn't one of those shows where I was aiming to be on time to catch all the opening act sets, especially considering how abominable the line for parking at Xfinity usually is, but I ended up enjoying myself during his set. He's mainly associated with country, but I see a guy like him having a hit here being another one of those big moments for rock like I talked about in Best Songs of 2021. 
I can understand if the lyrics here are a bit too Christian for one's liking, as that's usually the thing that turns a lot of people off about Christian music, even if they're Christians themselves. I've spoken in videos such as my Striper video about how I don't like being dismissive of an artist purely on the grounds of them being Christian, and that it's possible to listen past the religious aspect of their songs to see the true artistry and talent present. I myself am not religious at all, although I do believe in a god as a way for me to rationalize the creation of the universe to the best of my abilities, so I can understand the need some people feel to turn to god in desperate times when they feel they have no one else to turn to that they think will understand, like Jellybag does. One of my good friends, Thrash Metal Guru, became a more dedicated Christian years back largely for those reasons. Outside of this line, Jelly Belly here is incredibly vague about what it is that's pushing him in the direction of seeking out God, but much like I said about Taylor Swift, he's at least being open about the fact that he needs help, even if there's a part of him that feels like he's being selfish when doing so. But really, at the end of it all, this song jams. It might not be the most off-the-wall song I've ever heard, but I like when a song can sound groovy like this. A flat minor is such a cool key, and the chord progression of A flat minor, C flat, or B, G flat, D flat makes me think so much of the kinds of progressions you hear in hard rock. Even the little fiddle fills you hear sound like stuff the lead guitarist would throw in between lines. If a rock band played this song, there would not be much of a stretch at all with how the song would sound in that context. And whenever I say something like that, you know exactly what it's the setup for. It's largely for this reason why I came to the realization recently that Chris Stapleton is my favorite country artist, because he's basically a southern rock musician playing country. Jellyman is very similar, just that he implements more outside influences to come up with his own sound. So why am I putting Need a Favor at number one this year, over something relatable like Antihero or What Was I Made For, or something carefree like Dance the Night? Well, it's pretty much for the same reason I put Good For You by Olivia Rodrigo at number one two years ago, rock getting the representation I want to see in pop music. Even as the song is rooted in country, you can feel the rock deep within. Though if you think about it, this is kind of an amalgamation of all those songs I mentioned, along with the guitar-driven nature of Until I Found You. But that really just speaks to how unique of an artist Jelly Roll really is to me. Yeah, I'm gonna stop coming up with nicknames for him now. I've talked before in my Why I Hate the Rock is Dead argument video about how one way to improve the state of rock is for bands to allow for more outside influences to create a unique sound that helps them to stand out from the pack that clings more to tradition. But it's not like that can't also apply to country or even pop as a whole. Some of the most interesting songs I've talked about in this series have been those musical curveballs. It's the primary reason I look back at pop music in 2012 so fondly and consider it my favorite year for the genre. Jelly Roll is a guy I see really bringing something fresh to the scene, and as someone I think we could look to for some ideas on what we can do after a generally meh 2023 to make pop music great again. And of course, this video would not be complete without the ever so anticipated album rundown. A big part of why I wasn't feeling too confident in my picks for my year-end videos was because I was spending quite a bit of time with new album releases for this year. It's not going to top a year like last year, where a bunch of my favorite bands were all coming out with new albums, but I'd still say it was a pretty good year for albums. My top 100-something albums this year include, but are not limited to, in a somewhat accurate order of enjoyment, Carly Rae Jepsen's The Loveliest Time, Louis Capaldi's Broken by Desire to be Heavenly Sent, Ed Sheeran's Subtract, Waterpark's Intellectual Property, Chris Stapleton's Yumi at 6's Truth Decay, Dollar Sign's Legend Tripping, The Struts Pretty Vicious, NF's Hope, Three Teeth's Endex, Aberdeen's Held Together, Love Bites Judgment Day, Ad Infinitum's Chapter 3 Downfall, Meet Me at the Altar's Past Present Future, Versus the World's The Bastards Live Forever, Greta Van Fleet's Starcatcher, Post Malone's Austin, Corey Taylor's CMF2, Boy Genius's The Record, Teenage Wrist's Still Love, Stephen Wilson's The Harmony Codex, Aaron Jones' Chronicles of the Kid, Mom Jean's Bear Market, Escape the Fates Out of the Shadows, Stain's Confessions of the Fallen, Aesop Rock's Integrated Tech Solutions, Broadside's Hotel Blue, Enter Shikari's A Kiss for the Whole World, From Ashes to News Blackout, Colony House's The Cannonballers, Evile's The Unknown, Citizens Calling the Dogs, White Reapers Asking for a Ride, Phantom Elite's Blue Blood, Veil of Maya's mm. Other, Crossing the Rubicon's Eclipse, Gideon's More Power More Pain, Savage Hands, Paris's Evergreen, Hosier's Unreal on Earth, 
Scowl's Psychic Dance Routine, Moon Safari's Himmelbakken Volume 2, Andy James' Fury from Above, Dirty Honey's Can't Find the Breaks, Michigander's It Will Never Be the Same, Pain of Truth's Not Through Blood, Can't Swim's Thanks But No Thanks, Orbit Culture's Descent, The Used's Toxic Positivity, The Winery Dog's 3, Dayshell's Pegasus, Random Hand's Self-Titled, The Menzinger's Some of It Was True, Through Fire's Devil's Got You Dreamin', Butcher Baby's Eye for an Eye Until the World's Blind, Mammoth WVH's Mammoth 2, Liquor Works Parasitus Apparatus, Steel Panthers on the Prowl, Nate Wants to Battles to Let Go, Jonathan Young's Children of Night, Bad Wolves Die About It, Goose's Autumn Crossing, Code Orange's The Above, Entheos's Time Will Take Us All, Holding Absences The Noble Art of Self-Destruction, Dishana's Dreadfully Distinct, Nothing But Thieves Dead Club City, Avenge Sevenfold's Life Is But a Dream, Enforced War Remains, Blackstone Cherries Screaming at the Sky, Crime and Stereo's House in Trance, More I Pringles, Good times. Heart Attack Man's, Freak of Nature, Extremes, yes. Carmen Jaka's Ancient Skills, Queens of the Stone Ages in Times New Roman, Incendiaries Change the Way You Think About Pain, For Lack of a Terms Through the Dog Years, Forearms Pathway to Oblivion, Aviation's Luminaria, Baroness's Stone, Winger's Seven, Scaphoids Echoes of the Rift, from States Away's Sun in My Eyes, See in the Skies Fall in Place, Hot Mulligan's Why Would I Watch, Arch Echo's Final Pitch, Blink 182's One More Time, Varg Skeletor's Skeleton Metal X, Koyo's Would You Miss It, Pure Maze's Bloodlines, Creeper's Sanguivore, Story of the Years Tear Me to Pieces, Hohawk's Gallimaufry, Soen's Memorial, Jakob Zitecki's Remind Me, Scar Symmetry's The Singularity Phase 2 Xenotaph, Stream of Passion's Beautiful Warrior, Bearing's The Best Part About Being Human, Fireworks Higher Lonely Power, Real Friends There's Nothing Worse Than Too Late, Fall of the Albatrosses Right, Beartooth's The Surface, Movement's Ruckus, Silent Planet's Superbloom, Ice Giant's Ghost of Humanity, Spearbox's The Fear of Fear, Future Static's Liminality, My Senpai Tyler Larson's Lotus, Covet's Catharsis, The Zenith Passage's Data Elysium, Riverside's ID Entity, Swiss Army Wipes Medium Gnarly, Drain's Living Proof, Silosis is a sign of things to come. Bolero's. Is fatalism. Trophy eyes, suicide and sunshine. Shrezzers, sex and sax. Ramage Inks, humanity has failed. Pliny's mirage. Spanish love songs, no joy. The Raven Ages, blood omen. Angel Vivaldi's away with words part two. Nita Strauss's call of the void. Nabla of Ascaris's exul. Earthsides, let the truth speak. Night verses, every sound has a color in the valley of night part one. Knuckle pucks, losing what we love. Death clocks, death album four. Tesseract's War of Being, Matteo Mancuso's The Journey, Invent Animates Heavener, Sleep Tokens Take Me Back to Eden, Haken's Fauna, Periphery's Periphery 5, Gent is Not a Genre, I agree, it's a riff style, and my very predictable but nonetheless heartwarming album of the year, Foo Fighters But Here We Are. Praise Jesus. I admittedly was exaggerating a little when I called this year the drabbest year for pop music I've experienced in years. That was kind of how I felt throughout most of this year, and I still kind of do feel that way about the year. For a long time this year, I wasn't sure what I was going to expect to have featured in either of my year-end videos, so it felt nice to be surprised at all I showcased in this video. I still feel like 2022 had my favorite selection of songs I talked about in the Best Song series, outside of 2012 that is, but I think this year had the most interesting selection of songs, and I hope you enjoyed my analyses of them. Generally speaking, I had a pretty good year. I enjoyed feeling better and better about myself and making the progress in my physical and mental health, as well as all the music and video making escapades I went on this year. I'm quite pleased with what I had to offer for my 10th year making videos, especially when it came to the video I made for my channel's 10 year anniversary, Just Enjoy Music. The video I see as being what everything built towards. If there's any video I think everyone needs to watch, whether you're a newer or older viewer, it's that one, as it represents everything about the core values I espouse on this channel and what it really means to be a music fan. Looking forward to doing some more cool shit next year, I've got quite a bit of ideas lined up. Thank you for watching this video, take care and have a nice day. I'm Shades, and I'll see you next time. Um. Gotta think of something witty to end this one with. 24. 24.